Welcome to the Gamer's Tavern, episode 20. This episode is the first in a series of episodes we're doing on various campaign settings. And which one could we start with besides the biggest and most popular of them all, Forgotten Realms? That's right, we're diving deep into the world of Faerun. We have guest Richard Lee Byers with us to fill in the blanks on our memory and correct our pronunciations. And I just want to let you know that we've started a second podcast, Gamers Tavern Game Table, where we're doing an actual play of Shadowrun 4th Edition. The first episode's available now, and new episodes come out every Monday. Also, don't forget about our contest that runs until March 10th. So grab a drink from the bar and take a seat at the table in the corner, and you'll get all the details on how to enter our contest after this word from our sponsor. Don't think you have enough time to read the latest book? Well, you've got time to listen to us every week, so why not listen to your favorite books with Audible? Their library of over 150,000 audiobooks is the largest on the internet, all professionally produced with talented readers. Click on the link in the show notes at gamerstavern.org to get a 30-day free trial, including a free audiobook. Or, do you already know you want to subscribe now and don't need a trial? Then you can get your first three months half off for only $7.49. Catch up on Game of Thrones before the new season, reread the old Dragonlance series, or refresh yourself on the classic cyberpunk stories from William Gibson and Neil Stephenson. Sign up for Audible today by clicking on the link in the show notes at GamersTavern.org. Gamers Tavern's listenership has exploded in 2014, and we want to reward you, our loyal listeners, by holding a contest. We've got a winner-take-all bundle of amazing games, and to top it all off, an iPod Shuffle preloaded with the latest episodes of the Gamers Tavern. So, what other games do you get? How about a signed copy of Accursed, the dark fantasy Savage Worlds campaign setting where you play the monsters fighting against the witches who cursed you, provided by Meliorvia. A signed copy of Tefra, the steampunk fantasy role-playing game of high adventure set in an alternate world, provided by Cracked Monocle. A signed copy of Dementalism, a card game from the twisted and strange world of low life, provided by Mother Oith Creations. And a signed copy of Better Angels, a game of demonic comic book supervillainry provided by Arc Dream Publications. And you also get one free admission to Con on the Cobb, a celebration of game, art, freaks, and fun in Hudson, Ohio from October 16th through the 19th with the purchase of one adult admission. In order to secure your chance to win this amazing prize package, send an email to contest at gamerstavern.org with the subject line, Mac Sin. Include your name, mailing address, and one suggestion for how you would make the Gamers Tavern podcast even better. Once again, that email address is contest at gamerstavern.org with the subject line, Mac Sin. Sorry, but this contest is for U.S. residents only. Full contest rules are available at gamerstavern.org slash contest. Get your entry in by midnight central time on March 10th, 2014 for your chance to win it all. Hello and welcome to episode 20 of the Gamers Tavern. I'm your host, Ross Watson. And I'm Daryl Mott Jr. And tonight we have with us one of my favorite authors, Richard Lee Byers. Hey, how you doing? <laughs> doing great. It's wonderful to have you on the podcast with us. And I speak for both Daryl and myself when I say we're very grateful to have you join us tonight. Oh, it's my pleasure. See, tonight we have a, a different type of topic than some of the things we've talked about before in the show. Tonight's topic is actually going to be all about a campaign setting. The first in a series we're going to be doing on different campaign settings. That's right. And tonight's campaign setting is going to be The Forgotten Realms, of which Richard might know a little something. A little bit. <laughs> so, Richard, uh, one thing we ask all of our guests who come on the show is to tell us about their gaming character sheet. So maybe you can tell our listeners a little bit about who you are, where they might know you from, and where they can find you on the web. Uh, I'm Richard Lee Byers. I've written, uh, I guess, around 40 uh, fantasy and horror novels now, including a number of them set in uh, gaming settings. I've done a bunch in the Forgotten Realms. I've uh, done several back in the original World of Darkness uh, way back when. 
I recently had a novella set in the uh, accursed uh, setting. Oh just, yeah, he sure you did. Guys, you guys might have heard of that one. <laughs> <laughs> it was awesome. You should totally check it out on Drive Through RPG or Amazon.com. It's called the Festival at Glen Elk. That's right. And as far as my uh, resume as a gamer, I've been uh, playing D and D since it was. Uh, three beige pamphlets in a white cardboard box, and you had to uh, take the crappy dice and uh, <laughs> mark in the uh, the numbers with a crayon if you really wanted to be able to read them. That is old school. Yeah, and I've played, uh, played D&D, I've played uh, Call of Cthulhu, I've played Champions, I've played yes. Sea Heroes, <laughs> I've played some GURPS. Uh, so, you know, I've been batting around gaming for a while. Uh, well, next time we get together, Richard, we're going to have to talk about Champions a little bit because that is <laughs> my favorite favorite games. But that's 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 fantastic. And I, I want to take a quick moment to actually tell our listeners about something. I met Richard at Gen Con uh, last year, and I talked to him about some of the books he'd written for Forgot Realms. But I had completely forgotten. It slipped my mind that he wrote a trilogy of gaming novels that I thought were absolutely superb. And I wish I had thought about it then. But I can say now, Richard, since you're on the air – I am one of the biggest fans of the Scarred Lands trilogy, <laughs> and I thought you did a fantastic job on those. Well, thank you very much. Those are really uh, fun to write. I um, I wish the setting had lasted a little longer. I would have been uh, more than happy to come back and write more books about it, but uh, the whole thing kind of went south not too long after I wrote those. So, uh, alas, Scarred Lands is pretty much just a memory now, but I'm really glad you enjoyed those books. I thought they came out pretty well. The setting for Scarred Lands is really cool, uh, but I also, yeah, I did really just love the novels. And in case you, you didn't know, actually, uh, there's a company called Onyx Path that's sort of doing all the, the old White Wolf properties, and they have announced, Daryl, correct me if I'm wrong, but they've announced they're going to do Scarred Lands again, right? I believe they announced something along those lines. Uh, I can't remember when and what the announcement was, though. Well, there's been but something said publicly about it. Yes. So, you know, let's go there. Well, that's so. cool. I've, I've, I'll be looking forward to seeing that. Okay, so uh, the next thing we do on our podcast is we, we want to talk about briefly what we've been playing since uh, the last time we got together. So uh, why don't we start with you, Daryl? What have you been playing recently? And in my long tradition on this show, I haven't actually gotten to play anything. I've just been preparing to play stuff. But this time's a little bit different because this one's going to happen because it's happening this Friday. <laughs> Apparently, I just I just found out. Uh, I I know a couple episodes ago, Ross was talking about a Shadowrun character concept he had for a pink mohawk pixie who learned everything he knows about Shadowrun from like the Trids and Simpsons and all that. Basically, TV and the internet. And yeah. He doesn't actually have a pink mohawk, but he's in that style. Yeah, and I had the idea. You, in order to play this right, you've got to have the odd couple straight man to this. Well. The game that Ross was going to play that character and kind of fell apart, so I decided, hey, why don't we, you know, get together and do it for Gamers Tavern? So, uh, yeah, we're going to be, I don't want to promise anything yet because technical, got to worry about the technology around it, but we're going to try to record these and get them up on the air for as you guys an actual to play. Yeah, yeah, as an actual play. So and I'm, pl- I'm making my straight laced former company man, Street Samurai, who's by the book, and he's not going <laughs> to tolerate all the shenanigans from some wannabe. <laughs> Even though he deep in his heart he really likes the little guy. Oh, that's going to be fun. I am looking forward to that. All right. Uh, so, did, anything else, Daryl, or is that pretty much what we're looking forward to? And that's about it. No, that's pretty much it. I'm just right. kind of. I don't know how much my listeners, the listeners, of the show are going to be shocked that I'm playing the straight man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, Richard, what have you been playing lately? Uh, I have not been running a character because I've been GMing for my friends. I've been running the Carrion Crown Pathfinder uh, campaign. Oh, that was fantastic. Good one. And uh, other than that, let's see, we've been uh, we've played quite a few games of uh, Elder Sign. We're really enjoying oh. that. Yeah, yeah, that's a good game, too. Well, you know, I used to work at Fantasy Flight Games, and uh, the guys over there who designed Elder Sign are friends of mine, so... That being said, it is a good game. <laughs> and we play a lot of Hex Hex, too, when oh. we're fine for something really just, you know, fast. And <laughs> yeah, that's a uh, Smirk and Dagger, isn't it? I think so. Yeah, Kurt Covert, I believe, over there is the creator of that one. So super cool. And uh, as for me, like Daryl said, I'm creating a character for our actual play Shadowrun, at least our planned actual play Shadowrun. We'll have to see if that pans out as well as we think it will. 
um, which will start up this Friday. And I've been, of course, running my Accursed game uh, every weekend. And now that we've got our whole group of players back together, we had some issues with uh, with everyone's scheduling uh, from the holidays and so forth. But now that everybody's back together, we're actually making some really great progress on it. We had some great adventures in the Accursed uh, setting, and uh, that's coming along really well. I, I love Savage Worlds, and I love the way it's – I don't really have to prepare a whole lot for that game. Honestly. <laughs> so, so there's that. Okay, so we're going to try something new. Uh, isn't that right, Daryl? we got a new thing coming up. What would you say to someone who has never heard of what we're about to do on the Gamer's Tavern? Um, let's see if this works. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it was decided that we wanted to have some kind of cool question that we asked our guests that was kind of unique because it was kind of the thing we were lacking in our first 19 episodes as we, <laughs> you know, we talked to our guests and everything, but we didn't really have like a unique question or something special that that guest only said on our show. So we came up with a question and the in consultation with some of our fans. And uh, so our question for the very first time we're asking this question, but it's going to be like recurring from now on. Uh, so I'm like the guinea pig for this. You point. are. You are the introductory guest. <laughs> the question f- for you, sir, is what is your most memorable die roll? Oh, let me see. I think that it was very early on when I was playing uh, original d and I had this character who was on a, you know, elevated walkway above a bottomless pit kind of a setting. Classic. We'd fought these uh, goblins, killed all of them except this one, and I had told him that uh, he could live, you know, if he would be like, you know, our guy, you know, through this uh, complex, since he knew his way around and we didn't. And, uh, and, and it, he turned, he unexpectedly turned on me and shoved me, went to shove me off this walkway. And I had to make, I think it was a reflex saving throw and, uh, failed utterly. <laughs> so that was the first character I'd ever run. And he plummeted to his doom. <laughs> Curse your sudden, but inevitable betrayal. <laughs> no, that's a great story. I'm glad, well, I'm glad we had a great story for our first question and answer of that. Thank you very much, Richard. No problem. Okay. So now that we've gotten all of our our podcast kind of centered stuff out of the way, it's time to get into the meat of our topic for tonight, The Forgotten Realms. And I've actually got a quote from former yes. guest Sean Patrick Fannin in his book, The Fantasy Role-Playing Gamer's Bible, called Forgotten Realms, quote, the most ambitious fantasy game setting published since Tecumel. That's an interesting quote, and I would have to say I would – largely agree with him. I won't completely agree, but I will largely agree. I always tell people that I think the Forgotten Realms is the most detailed fantasy world probably ever created in any medium. Ooh, well, that's a bold statement. (laughs) Even more detailed, say, than uh, the Lord of the Rings and Middle Earth? Well, yeah, I think so, because at least least kind of... You know, if you look at a certain era of the Forgotten Realms, they had all those uh, guidebooks to all the kingdoms where where it's like you could go say, okay, you go to this town, you know, you go to this bar, you know, this is what you'll see on the wall, and uh, these are the drinks they serve, and this is the food they serve, and this is what it costs. I mean, it was incredibly detailed. That sounds like one of uh, Volo's guides. Yeah, those, those. I really love those Volo's guides. I'm a big fan of those. Yeah, I am too. I really, uh, I guess the market has changed, and so it's not practical. But I really wish that um, we could have, you know, the same wealth of uh, products and information about the uh, contemporary realms that they had, you know, back in the uh, days of AD and D, when well, there was just that ton of stuff. It was amazing. That might not work too well in the modern publishing market, but with the yeah. digital market now, all, all they need to do is get the writers and the art and the layout. And well, speaking. Editing. Speaking of the writers, I don't think you can bring up Forgotten Realms and certainly not the wealth of content for the Forgotten Realms and not mention Ed Greenwood. Oh, yeah. So for I anybody who doesn't know. I have a little know, fun fact okay. about Forgotten Realms. <clears throat> it was originally linked to our world, but that was dropped when TSR acquired it as a campaign setting because they feared lawsuits from kids getting injured, injuring themselves looking for secret portals. <laughs> well, that's interesting. But this was uh, – Ed Greenwood is the creator of the Forgotten Realms, for anyone who doesn't know. And it was uh, his home campaign setting for a number of years. And then it was published or – well, purchased, I guess I would say, by uh, TSR 
and became a cornerstone of the second edition Dungeons Dragons uh, milieu, if to use a term. Yeah, and I'm not going to be as dense with these coming up. I've got another good little factoid I looked up. Um, in, at least in terms of a 2010 interview he did with another podcast, Ed Greenwood said he still runs his original Waterdeep campaign with the same core players that they started in 1974. Wow. Yeah, uh, Ed actually started to create for, uh, Forgotten Realms when he was a kid. Just as, 1967, he was eight years old. Yeah, something to you know tell stories about before it was even associated with D&D. It was just this great imagine, you know, imaginary uh, realm, uh, realm that he created, uh, said it, and wrote stories about. Uh, and that's a phenomenal person. I mean, he's uh, he's a he's a genius. Well, I think you have. To, I mean, when we brought up the idea of like the wealth of content and the details that really bring the setting to life, that's where I initially thought of Ed because I was originally exposed to Forgotten Realms through the Dragon Magazine articles he wrote, mm-hmm. and. He also wrote all those Volo, Volo's guides. And yeah. like you said, they're just chock full of detail. When you open up a page and you look at something there, he'll tell you every little, not every little detail. I'm, I, that sounds, uh, that sounds bad, but he, there is a, a great deal of information about it in, in details that you wouldn't ordinarily see in other settings. Like, you know, how much it costs to get this particular dish and whether people really like that dish from this in, you know. And just lists and, of names of every single place in Waterdeep. Well, it's, yeah, and he's so, – so I would say that part of Ed's stamp on the Forgotten Realms is just that it feels alive in some ways because it's so incredibly rich with detail. And I, that's the term I should be using is rich, rich with detail. Yeah, I agree with that. It's, and it's so, it's so huge too. I, it's, I really like that you, know, you, you can never – explore all of it you know or never run out of things to write about or if you're gaming things to do in it because it's it's just such a vast setting and most of us you know just game in Farron. that's mostly what's been detailed so far but actually that's just uh the one, one of uh, several continents on the planet i've never asked you about this specifically i wouldn't be surprised to find out that ed has them all detailed <laughs> Farron. yeah possibly because that was also including uh was it Kara? Karatur is kind of the quasi Asia to the east of the Forgotten Realms, which yeah. is kind of sort of quasi Europe. You know, and there's Mestica, which is kind of sort of South America, and there's yeah. and then Alcadim, which is kind of sort of Arabian Nights. Arabian Nights, yeah. Well, I, and I I think I would agree with you uh, what you just said, Richard. Uh, but I I think that that's changed over time, and I, I would say like. In the second edition era, this is kind of my favorite. Like when I talk about what I love about Forgotten Realms, I, I talk about or what I think about is that original gray boxed set. Right. And there, there was a, uh, a hardcover book for second edition called Forgotten Realms Adventures as well. And uh, that portrayal of the realms to me felt very open and felt, as you said, like there was just never going to be something I would run out of places to go. But over time, I think – and this is something we'll probably bring up a little bit later. But over time, I think the, the development of the setting and, and things that have occurred with the setting, I think that, that it, it feels like the world is getting a little smaller, that there isn't very many places we haven't already seen. That's all I'm saying. You know, I think that the, part of the goal of the uh, time jump that, we, that they did, or I guess I should say that we did, I guess I'm partly complicit in it, <laughs> is that um, – you know, they, they took the setting 100 years into the future and uh, made a lot of changes. And the uh, – I think the goal of that was to kind of open open it up again and make it feel like, oh, there's new things to do and new places to explore. And on a uh, this was the spell plague. Right? Yeah, the spell plague was 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 part of it. The spell plague is not the reason. You know, the spell plague didn't like jump time. It's just something that happened right at the start of that hundred year period where we we jumped because this is a big cataclysm. You know, and, and and they didn't really want the game to be about eating rats in the ruins. You know. <laughs> So, so they had to give the setting time to recover from the spell plague. So uh, we have the spell plague, and then there's about a hundred years after that, and then we pick up the realms again. And like I said, they were trying to they're trying to freshen it up and you know create new situations, new antagonists, new places to go. And I think a lot of that worked, but they also kind of had an issue with you know losing some things and then finding out oh people really like so and so, and they kind of feel like well it's not the realms I love so much anymore if, if that's not there. So we just did this big event, the Sundering, which is supposed to uh, fix that. 
Well, I'm excited to find out more about that. But I think you hit on something that I really wanted to get into in this first part, which is talking about the favorite things, what you really love about the Forgotten Realms. And I'm curious, Daryl, could you answer that question? What would you say if I asked you, what do you love about the Forgotten Realms? In my opinion, it's one of the realms, and it's something we've already talked about a little bit. It's one of the, the realm's biggest strengths and also, in a way, one of its weaknesses is that there's so much material for it. It doesn't matter what kind of game I want to run. I can find a spot somewhere on Faerun, and I can run it. If I want to run an urban-based intrigue campaign, that's kind of Waterdeep's forte. If I want to run a underground exploration sort of thing, Underdark, if I want to do an overland adventuring, chase down the magical MacGuffin to stop the apocalypse sort of campaign, I can do that too. And every single, pretty much anything you want to run is in you know, this I think world. I'd, I'd go on record so, and say I think that Forgotten Realms' is Underdark is pretty much unequaled. Like, if you want to talk about subterranean realms in fantasy, it's... Unless you want to compare it to Undermountain. Which is part of Forgotten Realms. Yeah. <laughs> which is underneath yeah. Waterdeep. So I'm just saying, it's for, like in terms of the the underdark as a setting, as a as a, like a whole separate world that's un, in, you know beneath your feet. I, I would say Forgotten Realms has the most well developed and and interesting and unique underdarks of all fantasy worlds that I know of. Any of these? It seems to me like they put in a lot of thought when they were developing it in terms of how the ecology would work, how the societies yeah. would work, and all that. It's just fascinating to read about that. I, I could do an entire episode just talking about that, I'm sure, because I've, I've run an Underdark campaign. But. So so I I think we, you know, I asked, I think Richard kind of almost answered his question already with his, like, talking about the wealth of detail, but let's, let's ask him in a slightly different way. Is there a particular place or a particular person in the Forgotten Realms, Richard, that is your, your favorite or that sums up what you love about the realms? So as far as a particular place, I, you know, it's probably just Kind of the northeast, because I, that's where I buy books have tend to be centered in recent years, and so I've had the, I've had to research it more and find out what's cool about it and everything. And you know, I just I like it because my you know my characters adventure there. I like Fay a lot. I've written a whole bunch <laughs> about it and expect to write a bunch more about it. It's a <laughs> really interesting uh, place and uh, culture. Probably maybe more so before I kind of blew it up. In the <laughs> <laughs> but it's still pretty cool. Okay, that's going to be our subtitle for the episode is Faye was cool until I blew it up. There we go. Well, I really think it's still cool, but it's, <laughs> but it's, uh, it was, uh, I mean, I wrote that trilogy as a tragedy because I, I wanted to, even though Faye was an evil place, but from a, you know, a certain perspective, I wanted to write it as kind of, you know, kind of, you know, the people that live there didn't think of it that way. And it was, um, and it was tragic for them what happened to it. But, um, but anyway, that's, that's kind of a side topic. I, I really like the Northeast as far as you sort of a particular character. Um, well, again, it's you know, going to be, I'm going to sound egotistical. It's going to be somebody I write myself <laughs> is, uh, you know, Alf Fazim, who is the, uh, leader of my, uh, mercenary band, the Brotherhood of the Griffin, I think is, uh, He's a lot of fun to write about, and he's a a tough fighter, magic user. Writes this big intelligent griffin. Yeah, he's a he's in the undead book, isn't he? Yeah, he's a, he started out in the undead trilogy and then went on to the Brotherhood of the Griffin trilogy. He's a very fun character. I think he's a very recognizably D and D type character too, being a fighter magic user and <laughs> uh, you know the the magic items and the particular spells he commands. Or anything. I think he's a he's a good fit for the realms. You know, I think you brought up something really interesting there, is talking about Thay uh, specifically. Well, I, you know, Greyhawk kind of started with the idea that there were organizations of, of people in the in the world that had their own agenda, and and it kind of started the idea that adventurers could sort of you know be sponsored, you know, in that way. But I think the Forgotten Realms took that idea and really slam dunked it because I had never really seen that idea of like we are the Brotherhood of the Banner or whatever. You know, they had they had all these. Uh, in the original gray box, especially they, they talk about how the King or, or other agents will sort of give a, a contract or a, I forget what it's called, but there's a commission. Charter. Basically. charter I yeah. A charter. Yeah. They will charter an adventuring party. I thought that was really cool. But the thing that even more blew me away was there was this organization called the Zentarim and they were very well organized bad guys who took great advantage of all of the uh, magical stuff you can find in the forgotten realms. 
So you you kind of get this, you know, at least in my, in my experience as an early Dungeons and Dragons player, you get this idea that, you know, adventurers are super special and there's very, it's not every day you're going to run into a guy with a dragon for a mount and a, and a you know, wand of mag, uh, magic missiles. But in the Forgotten Realms, the Zentarum, that was basically one of their, you know, scouting parties. Was right. was like a guy riding a dragon with about three wands, and you know, <laughs> I thought that was it was it was kind of like fighting your your mirror match in some ways. The Zentarum, because they were also plundering tombs, looking for you know relics of ancient lore and things like that. Uh, so, and then there was the Harpers, of course, which was a. I'm a huge fan of the Harpers. It was yeah. that was the first group I remember from any game, and I'm not saying it was the first one in a game. It's just the first one that I remember where it was. Usually when you have all these secret societies and everything and everyone's gathered together for a common purpose, they're always the bad guys. The Harpers were the first one that were kind of the good guys in a way. Most yeah. of the time they're the good guys. Yeah, they're pretty much the good guys, although, you know, that you can find yourself at cross purposes with them for sure. In fact, they even have at least one splinter group from the Harpers called the Moon Stars that mm -hmm. didn't, you know, I guess the goals are basically the same. They didn't think the Harpers were... Uh, kind of activist or enough or, or something. Like, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if I got that right. I think I do. I think the moon star is a little more hardcore. That was another thing that I really like about the setting is that uh, on its surface, if you just kind of look at it, it looks like your standard fantasy, good and e good versus evil and everything the, even the good guys in forgotten realms. And this was by design from Ed Greenwood. Even the good guys aren't necessarily as good as you think they might be, or especially as they think they might be. Just because they're good and doesn't mean they're going to help you. That and even the good guys, when they do good things, he was a big fan, was, it probably still is, a big fan of what on TV tropes is called Good Job Breaking It Hero, where the heroes mm -hmm. do something do something good, and because of their actions, they overthrew the evil emperor. Yay! Except now there's a civil war breaking out and thousands of people are dying a day. Oops. Mm -hmm. Not saying that happened in Forgotten yeah. Realms, but that's an example of that trope. Yeah, his signature character is Elminster, who is kind of the spokesman for, you can't foresee all the consequences. You have to be careful, you know, because you know, there's, I think it's in one of the, it might be in the old gray box, or it's in, there's one one thing that he wrote in, in Elminster's voice about, you know, it said, well, you know, people say, why don't I just go blow away all the bad people? And it's it's not that simple. You know, you can't do just do that. Well, that, you, you know, you, you brought up a very, I would say, volatile point right there. <laughs> <laughs> I would say it's a common complaint or criticism of the Forgotten Realms is that... A, something we've brought up many times before, Yeah, too. well, it's, it's actually got a name. It's called the Elminster Syndrome, mm -hmm. which is, and let's define the term just so we know what we're talking about. Um, basically, the, the, and I'm paraphrasing, but the, the, uh, the Elminster Syndrome is where you have an NPC of such great power and great involvement in the world that it tends to lessen the agency of the actual players to cause lasting change. And what, what this basically means is, kind of like what Richard has just brought up, is you know, the Game Master can always say, okay, well, there's bandits that are on the, the road to Shadowdale, and they're, they're stopping everybody from getting to Shadowdale, and it's a big problem, so we need you adventurers to go do it. But the perception that one can get, and I, I certainly can see how this perception would be would be attained. The perception one would get from reading the Forgotten Realms novels is that Elminster visits every freaking tavern that exists <laughs> and, and comments on it at length, especially in like the Volo books and so forth. So you you kind of feel like not only is Elminster super powerful, but he's been everywhere and knows everything. And it it does definitely create the the idea of like, well, surely you know he'll be along to handle this, and if it's not him, then it's many other high-level NPCs that are pretty much everywhere you look in the Forgotten Realms. Even the barman is probably a 12th-level fighter with a magic sword behind the, the taps, you know what I mean? You know, I always I think that that's really a situation that, you know, you could say that about almost any um, fantasy story where, you know, the, the gods are real and walking around, too. It's, and you know, all. It's, you know, it's always thinking where the, where the god gives the hero, you know, some vitally important task. Yeah. Uh, if I was the hero, I'd want to say, well, what are you doing with your afternoon? You're the powerful one. You know, so. Well, and, and, and I want to be super clear here. I am a fan of Forgotten Realms. I really like the Forgotten Realms. I think Daryl and I and Richard all probably can say with a straight face, we love the Forgotten Realms. That being said, I do. I I have often kind of felt this way myself just from reading. And I'm going to push back on Daryl a little bit. I think there's a significant mm. difference between Gandalf 
and Elminster in that they're both par- characters who have a, a great deal of power. It's true. But Gandalf's involvement in, in Middle Earth is very insignificant in, in terms of like he only you know, he only ever deals with like a handful of people. He only ever goes to a very small amount of places. You know, it doesn't feel like he's going to mark the fall of every sparrow. Whereas with Elminster, again, just and I think this is just an artifact of him being so prominent in all of the write ups of all the different places and, and having met everyone and having uh, having relations with multiple goddesses, for example, <laughs> which is a true thing. Um, yeah. you, you kind of get the impression that Elminster does mark the fall of every sparrow. I mean, he is, as we mentioned previously, heavily involved with a spy network, basically the Harpers. That covers, you know, the majority of the known world. So that's what I that's where I think I would point out the difference between those two characters. Well, if you have I mean, isn't that only a problem to the extent that, you know, people obsess about it? I mean, if, in fact, Elminster doesn't show up in your campaign, you know, never does walk on stage and there are these important tasks to be done and you set the PCs to do them. I mean, what real difference does it make that he's out there? Well, and, and I, you know, I think you've got a great point that this is actually more of a problem of perception than of reality. If I, if I understand what you're saying. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I mean, if he never shows up in your game, who gives a rat's ass? That, that in the abstract, he's defined as this powerful guy that could do easily the stuff that the player characters are doing with more difficulty because, you know, he's not there doing it. He's over on the other, he's on, on the other side of the continent doing something else. I do have a certain sympathy. I, I have a certain uh, certain perspective on this point of view because actually, I, I've even gotten it as a novelist. I wrote a trilogy called *The Year of Rogue Dragons*, which is about a big, potentially devastating situation in Farron. And a couple of people, you know, said to me, "Well, you know, if it was really that bad, Elminster would have just showed up and handled it." And I'm like, "You know, the book. You know, I don't write Elminster. Ed writes Elminster. And in my books, he's at the dentist. Get over it." You know? <laughs> Yeah, and, and I think I think that's a perfectly reasonable counter argument to that. But I, all I want to point out is like I think I think that the the perception I can see why I, I guess I'm saying the perception can be valid based on what I know of things. Maybe that's not the reality. Like I think you made a great point that it's probably he probably hardly ever shows up in anybody's actual campaign. Yeah, uh, but it's certainly like from reading it, you kind of I, I can see why people would feel like that is something that they would expect. And it's kind of the con- consequence of being the big guy in the most popular setting. You get the problem named after you, even if it's not a big problem for you. So the same thing crops up in, say, Shadowrun. People can say, oh, it's another Elminster problem. Well, even it, though it's yeah, probably Harlequin, definitely yeah. a thing there. Harlequin and Lofweir have both been accused of this in the mm-hmm. Shadowrun setting. So yeah, it, it's, it's not limited to just the Forgotten Realms, but that is where the, the trope gets its name. Well, I think one thing people have to recognize, too, is that genres have conventions. In DC Comics, you know, any time, you know, all the individual members of the Justice League have their own titles where they deal with these all these tough challenges and potentially, you know, catastrophic situations if they, if they fail. And, um, you know, if you're going to just apply cold, hard logic to that, is why, why do any of these characters ever tackle the these really bad situations solo when they're members of the Justice League. Where are the Avengers when Spider-Man's having to fight someone and losing? Exactly. Be- yeah, it's because the, it's a different type of story. And the they're same. all in New York City, so... Yeah. I mean, it's the, it's the genre. Yeah, I mean, it's... Um, right. It's not that I, kind of story. That's what yeah, you're there's saying. Yeah, not, there's not really any more point worrying about that than there is worrying about how does the magic work in terms of real-world science. It wouldn't. You know, you just accept that it does. Well, let's uh, let's leave Elminster behind a little bit. And oh, yeah. I think one thing we can definitely say sets this, the Forgotten Realms apart um, is it does have a very broad cast of memorable characters. Mm-hmm. Um, I would say some of the most remarkable ones being uh, Kelvin Arunson, called the Blackstaff, uh, Lord Piergaron, uh, obviously Drizzt Doerden from mm-hmm. Bob Salvatore's books. What are some other ones, Daryl? I haven't read enough of the novels, honestly, to tell you. Well, I'm, no, I, this, some of these characters uh, have, have only rarely or briefly appeared in novels, like the Seven Sisters. I'm also, I'm also absolutely uh, horrible with Storm names, and I, I spent uh, almost all my time in Forgotten Realms hanging around Waterdeep, unless it's in... Because I read a bunch okay. of the Dritz novels. And Have you heard of Illustrial or Storm Silverhand? Silverhand I have. 
Okay, well, and there's also, I forget her name, but she's the wife of Calvin Arenza. But there's a group called the Seven Sisters yes. who are uh, related to Elminster. And, and there's also the, the symbols, one of them. They're all the, uh, ch- they're the seven chosen of Mistra, I believe. Right. That's right. Uh, so that's just one example of, of memorable characters that are straight out of the, not even out of the novels, just straight out of the, the setting. There's, of course, Zastam, who's the, uh, the undead Lord of the Red Wizards. Very My cool. guy. I wrote a- <laughs> <laughs> He's all over my Fae trilogy. And uh, even the Zentarium have their own cast of really memorable guys as well. And you've also got the Masked Lords of Waterdeep, obviously. Uh, of which Lord Piergaron is one. What, what I think also we should touch on this while we're talking about characters is um, the Forgotten Realms has been so so well developed in fiction. I think, Richard, you'd agree with that. It's it's a, Yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll go with that one. <laughs> <laughs> even starting from the old uh, Jeff Grubb, uh, Azra Bonds novels, you know, way back in the day. Right. Uh, he there. There's been a steady group of what I would say very talented authors. Elaine Cunningham being one of my favorites is along with Richard Bob Salvatore, of course, with the uh, s- sketching out what we know of Icewind Dale. Pretty much all comes from Bob Salvatore. And that was a uh, and originally he got the uh, he was hired to do the novels for something else, and then he got put on to Forgotten Realms. And so he kept saying, right. "Okay, I want to write here. Oh, you can't do that. Jeff's writing something there. Okay, I want to write here. Well, Ed's writing something there." And so he went over this map, which the map wasn't really a map. It was a bunch of eight and a half by 11 pieces of paper that were faxed to his office. And it was a giant map. So they pulled a conference room, shoved all the chairs and tables to the floor and laid out this giant map on the floor. And he found this one thing up in the corner. He says, what's this up in the corner here? It says Icewind Dale. It's like, uh, oh, that's, I think that's a misprint or something. I've talked, nope, it's not a misprint. It's mine. That's mine. You guys stay out. That's mine. <laughs> Well, uh, I'll, I'll say this: like we from. wouldn't know, we wouldn't know as much as we do know about the really interesting uh, Elven cultures of the Forgotten Realms without Elaine Cunningham and uh, developing it through her books about Errol and Moonblade and her books about Evermeet, um, for example. Um, obviously, Bob kind of sat down what the Drow were like in the Forgotten Realms um, to a smaller extent, maybe the Dwarves. Well, let me ask. Let's ask the novelist, mm-hmm. Richard. What What do you think is probably the most interesting things that have developed about the Forgotten Realms from the fiction? Sembia was pretty much just kind of a blank on the map until some of us were brought on to do the Sembia sequence and about the Escavrin es- family. That so that, you know that we can take a lot of the credit for that. Yeah, that was Paul S. Kemp uh, Paul as well. Kemp. On that, I worked on that. Let's see, God, um, Lisa Smedman worked on that. Yeah. Dave Gross, Lisa, uh, and David are both extreme. All of those guys you mentioned are really very talented authors. As far as other stuff that comes from that, I mean, you know, Bob's work is is really big. Um, Elaine wrote Evermeet Island of the Elves, in which is kind of a big uh, sort of like sort of like James Minster's Hawaii or something. You know, <laughs> that kind of a book that really laid out the whole history of that realm. There's a uh, a Cormier book that's like that. I think Ed wrote it in collaboration with somebody else who's I'm sadly I'm blanking on, but it's, it's that's a comparable kind of book. Right. I and think, I, I mean, as far as like laying the, um, like laying down the fundamentals of what a particular place is like, that would be some of the main ones. A number of us have done books where something really interesting and dramatic uh, happens in a particular area. And along the way we, you know, we kind of show it in a way, that particular area in a way that maybe even a good source book wouldn't show it, you know, wouldn't give you the, the, the kind of the feel and the taste of it. But I don't know if we could actually say we created it. Well, I'll, I'll even go so far as to say the uh, Forgotten Realms comic book. Actually, the Forgotten Realms book and, comic book and the, the Strander Dungeons and Dragons comic <laughs> book back in the, uh, the 90s, I think, were both set in the Forgotten Sorry, Realms. The, the only thing I know about the Forgotten Realms comic book is cheese. That was their that well, was their special a, I, special episode one they did. All right, I, I'm not familiar with that one, but I am familiar with a really a really good comic book that was set in the Forgotten Realms, and there was another one that I believe they were both comics set in the Forgotten Realms, but one was actually called the Forgotten Realms, the other one was just kind of called Dungeons and Dragons. They I had a, so. a centaur character and they had a golem character. That's some really cool like people you would never see in an adventuring party on the table, but they were still very cool and interesting characters. I think they've got one or more comics running now, although I have to admit I have not read them. But I, I think they are, they're a series going now. So now uh, okay. Salvatore and his son were writing something Forgotten Realms, weren't they? Comic book? Quite possible. They, they did a, they've done one or more novels. I'm not sure about a comic. Hmm. Well, you know, and since we're talking about 
novels and things like that. That's a really great segue to get us into talking about some of the other tie-ins for the Forgotten Realms. And I'm going to specifically point out uh, video games. Uh, Richard, have you played any video games set in the Forgotten Realms? I have not. I, I know they're out there. I haven't played them. There are some that are considered to be the most iconic or some of the, uh, the best in their actual category. Of course, I'm talking about Baldur's Gate and Baldur's Gate 2. Uh, these games were the uh, sort of top-down, isometric, not really turn-based, although you kind of play it that way, adventure RPGs that were published, uh, I want to say back in the 90s. Is that uh, right, yeah. Daryl? Early 80s 90s. I think, I think the 90s. first Baldur's Gate was 90, the second one was 92, 93, and then the and these Neverwinter games, Nights were 95 and 98, yes. eight, I believe. And they were definitely followed by Neverwinter Nights. And what's really great about Baldur's Gate is that not only is it a high-quality game, uh, and, it, and they are, but they're also a high-quality introduction to what the Forgotten Realms are all about. And if people haven't played them, actually, the uh, remastered editions, uh, what's called the, what are they called, the something edition? Enhanced edition, that's what they're called. Uh, the enhanced edition of Baldur's Gate and Baldur's Gate 2 are actually available now, um, and I've played through both of them, and they're wonderful. They, they've, if you have, if you played them back in the nineties and you thought, wow, that was a lot of fun, go, go check out the enhanced editions because they add even more content. But there's like characters, uh, I would say, actually, I don't know if you know this, Richard, but there is a list of the greatest companion characters of all time mm-hmm. in video games. And one, in the top 10, if not the number one in almost all of these lists is a guy called Minsk from Baldur's Gate. Uh huh. And he is freaking awesome. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, uh, again, just these, these games were not only high quality games, they were high quality stories, they were high quality introductions to what the Forgotten Realms were all about. Um, and this extended into Neverwinter Nights. Daryl, did you ever play Neverwinter Nights? I played it one time and I want to say like 2000, 2002, and that was way too much bourbon to go for me to remember exactly, uh, <laughs> what I, I just remember it was kind of cool, but it was also, it was an RPG, you started off slow, but so it, because you're trying to build your levels well, say, and everything. It was it was a lot better than a lot of the games of that era at doing that. I'll say this. I, I think Neverwinter Nights 2 is the more impressive of the two of the two games. Is the sequel is definitely a lot. In, in like terms of Baldur's Gate, both of them are great. In terms of Neverwinter Nights, I think the second one is the great one. I, did, I do know one little cool bit of trivia about the two Neverwinter Nights games. In the first Neverwinter Nights games, it is possible to kill Dritz Stewart. If you do... Oh, it's, it's possible to kill him in Baldur's Gate. If you do kill him in the first Neverwinter Nights, in the second Neverwinter Nights, he's going to show back up again. And if you carry over your save files, he is not going to talk to you. He is just going to attack because he remembers. That, that was, Daryl, that was taken directly from Baldur's Gate and Baldur's Gate 2. Oh. The, the same exact thing occurs. Maybe I mixed up the which games it was then. Well, see, there's a great reason to kill him in Baldur's Gate because he has awesome gear. <laughs> <laughs> so moving on. Uh, Neverwinter Nights 2 uh, was written by Chris Avalone, who's been a guest on our show before. So there's that. And it's it's got a high-quality set of characters as well in that game. Although the ending, you know, I, I'll respect you, Chris, but I, I really don't like the ending of Neverwinter Nights 2. <laughs> anyway. Have you guys played the uh, Neverwinter uh, MMO that's up now? We have. I have not. Daryl, have you read, played it? I have, I'm not a big video game guy, so I haven't. I, I know a little bit about it, but I haven't played any of it. Have you played it, Richard? No, I was just wondering what your impression was. Well, I would, I don't know yet. I haven't. I know. Tried. I know Bob has created content for it. He's, yeah, he worked on some, uh, some of the quests are, are, are things that he he created himself. So I would assume that at least those parts of it are cool. He also worked <laughs> on a Kingdoms of Amalur Reckoning, um, and there was an MMO that was being worked on as well by Thirty Eight Studios that he was involved with that before that studio kind of crumbled and fell and it was a big deal so but anyway mm-hmm. daryl what's the next thing we should talk about with forgotten realms well we we've, we've talked about ed and his influences on this i kind of want to talk a little bit about salvatore's influence on the game he, he's undeniably a big influence on the game yeah. not just a big influence it's to the point where there are many people who more associate forgotten realms with salvatore's work than they do at greenwood granted these are people who obviously are more casual fans of the setting or D and D, but uh, Dritz de Warden's kind of become an iconic character in that setting, even though he's not the big ultimate powerful wizard. He's just a badass with a couple scimitars. 
Well, Bob has written an awful lot of books. <laughs> yeah. I've only read about the first nine or ten Dritzt books, but I've got to say Homelands, uh, which was the first story chronologically of the story. It was the fourth book in the Dritzt series because it followed the Ice, Icewind Dell. This was a flashback, but it was, it is hands down one of my favorite tie-in fictions that I've ever read because it just went into so much depth in this culture that up until this point, the drow were just, they're the bad guys. You go kill them. And it actually went and explored how their society worked. And it was a really fascinating look at that sort of, um, it's the word I'm looking for. Uh, I don't, I don't think it's jingoism, but it's just outlook. Maybe well, no, it's a, it's a specific style of where it's basically untapped Political potential structure. things. Like basically very, very open to you're always watching your back traders all the time. And it's, very chaotic, but it's a controlled chaos. And oh, America! <laughs> I'm kidding. It's it's a yeah, it's a, it's a totally paranoid kind of society. To all the NSA agents who are listening to us record this podcast, I just want to say I am a total patriot. Um, anyway, and please don't forget, I used to have a security clearance. <laughs> yeah, Homeland is is a really great fantasy novel. It's a really um, daunting one to try that that, and by extension, Bob's whole body of work because you know he keeps dealing with the drow and book after book is a very intimidating thing to try to uh kind of you know work around or add a little something to you i wrote worked on one of those you worked on one of the war of the spider queen yeah thing, didn't I, I you? worked on uh yeah i worked on the first book in the r.a salvatore's war of the spider queen series <laughs> and which is all set in menzo baron's on just like uh, homeland and uh, when i was writing that book it was like like uh you know, between him and Elaine Cunningham, who has also written some books about the drow, is like, geez, what, you know, what can I show and what can I talk about that they didn't already <laughs> do brilliantly? You know, I mean, if, 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 if you look, if you read uh, Dissolution, which is the title of my book, it's almost, I mean, you could almost map it as like, well, nobody said us, no, neither Bob nor Elaine said us seen here so <laughs> that that's, that's where I'm going. Cause I felt like, you know, there's, you know, I can't beat them at their own game. I'm not going to show something something they already showed and showed it better because they're so damn good, you know, and, and their work on the drama was so beloved. So I was just really, really working to say, well, what what else is down here that I can show? Fortunately, there's this great Menzo Barons on box set, right, mm -hmm. which details the whole city in a lot of detail, and there's a whole lot to it. So I said, okay, I can go here. I can go here. I can do that. And that's how I wrote that novel. Yeah, and, and if you look at like any of the second edition Dungeons and Dragons books that are like focused on Drow, there's a book called Drow of the Underdark, for example. It's very clear that his work on defining that particular race kind of spread out through the zeitgeist, if you will, of the the creators at the time. Well, it's it's such a you know, it's such a powerful vision. I mean, you know, who doesn't I mean, who doesn't love a society what's what's is so beautiful and exotic and you know, rich in magic and so damn evil. <laughs> it's just fun. Yeah. And in his books, it, yeah, Dritz gets a lot of complaints. And again, I've only read about the first nine, so I can kind of see where it may have gone in this direction. But of Dritz himself being, you know, kind of flat and a little bit boring and a little bit to the point of being Mary Sue, a lot of people say. I don't agree with that personally, but I can yeah, see I where they might either. see that. Well, but, I think I, I kind of know where that's coming from, Daryl. Hmm. There was a period of time, and I want to say it was mid to late 90s, that if you were playing Dungeons and Dragons and someone brought a character to the table who was an elf, there was probably an 80 to 85% chance that that character was a drow with two scimitars. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. it's fair to say Driz is probably the most imitated fantasy character that I'm aware Worse of. than Wolverine and Shadowrun. Oh, uh, maybe not. Okay. But really <laughs> close. All right, they're probably, you know, it's neck and neck for the most imitated, you know, fictional character as a role playing game character. The one thing I wanted to bring up about that is he had so many other characters that were really, really cool and interesting. Artemis and Trary is always a favorite of mine. Oh, my God, hand. he's amazing. Great character. It is. And he is one of the few bad guys who kind of gets away with it. Oh, in no, that no, era no, no. The game, which... Well, yeah, he's he, OK. So you want to talk about bad guys who get away with it? Yeah, he's one of them. But well, during um, that during that era. Well, I'm still talking about during that era. Oh, OK. Okay. Uh, the, the other one from the same era, and I'm sure Richard's going to know who I'm talking about, is Elaith the Serpent Kralnober. Yeah, in Elaine's books. Oh, God. He was – Elaine took a character that I think Ed had just kind of made as like a 
like an entry in a book somewhere. By the way, there's this guy called Elaith. And uh, she took him in, as she described it to me one time, she said, I put him in my purse and ran away. <laughs> and she just, she does this, this wonderful evil elf who's totally not a drow, by the way, totally a surface elf and is going to, you know, he will never let you forget his heritage, let me tell you. <laughs> but that is another, one thing about the Forgotten Realms that I think we, we kind of glossed over that, but great villains, wonderful villains, including Artemis and Elaith and, and Zastam and all of the guys we've talked about before. And even when you get the ones that are like cookie cutter villains, where they're just like always a lot of the drow had a lot of depth to the characters, even though they were just pure, flat out evil and doing things just to do evil things, which is, as I've said on previous podcasts, something I'm not a fan of. Well, Richard told us what his favorite hero was, which is his, his Griffin Rider, Magic User, Fighter Magic User guy. I forget the name, actually. Um, what's yeah, his name? Alf. <laughs> so who's your favorite villain, Richard? Oh, uh, gotta be Saz Tom. Yeah. I mean, I said, I, I wrote him in uh, my Fae trilogy and, you know, I just loved him. I really like Samaster, too, though, who I, uh, you know, who I killed, but he can, of course, get better. If, <laughs> <laughs> if we ever, if anybody ever decides that he should, but he, he was a lot spell. of fun. I did a Chazar in my uh, Chacenta books, which, who was the dragon king of Chacenta back in the day and had been lost for a hundred years. And I brought him back, but I brought him back crazy. So he was sort of <laughs> dragon king Caligula. <laughs> and, uh, he was a lot of fun to write. You see, I'm egotistical enough that my favorite stuff is the stuff I did. I don't know. <laughs> if I'm being honest, I got to say that. No, oh, hey, that counts. That totally counts. One of the things I thought was really cool about Threat Realms, too. I mean, Daryl, did you have a favorite villain? I mean, let's, before we move on. But... Again, Artemis and Cherry. And Artemis and Cherry, yeah. My favorite story of his survival has nothing to do with in game. This was the first trilogy took place during the. It was during the tail end of first edition. When they were moving to second edition, uh, correct me if I'm wrong on the timeline here, but I believe that's when they had the time of troubles was the switch over from first to second edition to cover the rules changes they were doing. Well, if that's, well, time of troubles is post second edition. Um, in that second edition was out and it was around. Well, so, maybe, I mean, okay, maybe, well, maybe you're right. I, you know what? I'm just, that was, that was the, that was I'm the big gonna, cataclysm I, that happened in Faerun to cover it. As I understand it, I may be say wrong, is, I'm not an expert. expert on this, but that's the way I remember it. So if you listeners, if, if you could correct me, go ahead, please correct me and tell me when it was. <laughs> it's early. But what happened was Salvatore got a call from TSR saying, okay, uh, how do you want to kill Artemis? I'm like, wait, what? It's like, well, Artemis and Tra- Bane's dead and his, all his assassins that follow him, all the assassin souls are going to the void. So we don't want this great character to have such a crappy death. We want to give him a better death. How do you want to kill him? I'm like, uh, I don't want to kill him. And so they went back and forth saying, well, he's an assassin. He has to die. All the assassins are dying, but I don't want to kill him. He's a great character. I'm really starting to like him now because he's getting a little bit more three dimensional than just the bad guy dragging Caterbury around. And it's like, well, Dobie, you have to kill him. He said, okay. All the assassins are dying. You have to kill him. Salvador comes back and says, he's not an assassin. He's a fighter thief who kills people for money. <laughs> and then the TSR person goes, okay, we can work with that. Yeah. It's all what, in the TSR was, yeah, what TSR was doing there is a prime example of what you shouldn't do when you, uh, <laughs> when you have a, uh, you know, have a, have a universe that has gaming products and uh, fiction products. You shouldn't, you shouldn't think that the fiction products have to be pegged to the minutia of the game rules. That's, that's a bad way to proceed. I don't think they're doing that anymore. And I really hope that they don't get back to it. Well, the, the rumor, I, the rumor is that Salvatore and Greenwood themselves were involved with the Sundering event that they're doing for the new edition. Well, hang on. I want to, I want to actually address something Richard just said. Now, mm-hmm. yeah, I, I agree with you. In the broad sense that you shouldn't be your hand, your hands should not be tied by the game mechanics. But right. but would you agree if I said that the verisimilitude of what the Forgotten Realms is is to some extent bound up in those mechanics because we know what wizards can do because we know what fighters can do that kind of a thing. Well, what I think is the ultimate reality is not the right word, obviously, because we're talking about something that isn't real. But what is the ultimate? truth of the forgotten realms or any comparable world is this you know vision that we all have in our imagination you know this this picture that's painted of it and and the gaming rules are a way to reduce that to something that you can play with dice and pencil and paper and you know and numbers that's fine but you get to a level of minutia where it's only about playing the game it's not really about the 
greater truth of this fantasy that we're all sharing. So if I write a story where the red dragons breathe fire, like they do in the Forgotten Realms, you know, that's good. That's what the way it should be. If I write a story of the red dragons breathe ice, that's wrong. That's clearly wrong. And that shouldn't be in a Forgotten Realms story. But if I write a story about the centers on the minutia of, uh, you know, hit points and armor class and the stuff that we do just so we can, uh, like I say, use dice to represent something like a sword fight, that's not useful. That, that, and that's, that's conducive, conducive to good storytelling. Do you see what I'm trying to say? Yeah, I, th- I think I get it. It's like you're, you're serving two masters, but you can't really do that in fiction. You have to be able to tell the story first and try to make it fit the mechanics the best you can, but the story has to come first because otherwise I'm just reading someone give me a, giving a play-by-play of their tabletop game. Right. So we brought up the idea of the time of troubles, and that is actually a great segue into another point about the Forgotten Realms, is that there is a overarching meta plot for the Forgotten Realms and a timeline which has advanced over the years. And this has been marked by some major events that have affected not only things like edition changes and kind of the way the world works in the tabletop setting, but also have shifted a a great deal of things in the fiction. So the first of these was, of course, the Time of Troubles, and this is when the gods basically were kicked out of heaven and were forced to walk the earth of the – well, walk the Forgotten Realms in physical form for a while. It was was actually a very cool story. I got a kick out of it. But it changed the realms. And then after that, the second one is – Richard, help me out here. The second one is when the – I think that was just the Cataclysm, and that wasn't just Forgotten Realms. That was Planescape and Spelljammer and everyone. Maybe. That's when Vecna got sent to Ravenloft. And then broke out of Ravenloft. I don't remember seeing that reflected in the fiction, but okay. I think there was um, something about a, a a city of the shade, the the, the, the Hal ruins, right? They had this these uh, shadow people that had gone away and had suddenly come back, and you have this giant well, flame well, city. Ancient, yeah, the ancient shade empire of Netheril. Yes, was, that's them. Again, uh, that's that's not like a change. I mean, that's like a big big event in the setting. It's not. It maybe falls a little short of a you know this moment changes everything kind of cataclysm, but it's certainly a big deal. So there was that the was that the second or third one, Richard? You, you're talking about since. I mean, if you go if you look at the the, the uh, whole timeline of the Forgotten Realms way back into the the dawn of time, there have been a bunch of cataclysmic kind of events. But you mean during the course that people have actually been playing the game, right? Yeah, that's what I mean. As far as like since since it came out in the '80s to now. Well, let's see. Whether well, we have the Time of Troubles, which well, you know was the a big deal. We, so the Return of the Shades was was been a big deal. I did the um, Year of Rogue Dragons, which was about biggest, worst, and as it turns out, last rage of dragons that there will ever be. There was The Threat from the Sea that Mel Odom wrote, which Oh, was God, those are great books. It, b- b- threat, you know, marine invasion of the, the Sahaugan and uh, evil sea creatures. I'm a, we're going to try to get Mel on the show eventually, mm-hmm. and I'm going to, that's one of the things I'm going to bring up is, is Threat from the Sea, because I really like those books. So, I mean, we've had a lot of big events. I would say, I think most of them, most of them actually stopped short of, you know, changes everything like the threat of the sea from the sea it didn't i don't know if it really produced lasting change it was just like here's a big problem and it takes us three novels to beat it back kind of a deal but um, right so so in the in terms of like the time of troubles scale lately there's been one there was one for the transition from third edition to fourth edition that was the spell plague and the merging of um because uh toral and another world started to merge yeah, uh, yeah, Toral and if you guys say so if you go back into you know prehistory of the realms and the metaphysics, there's some stuff that indicates that that Aber Toral was this double world that split apart, and in the spell plague, they the two worlds become congruent again, and you have all kind of cosmic upheaval. Magic stops working correctly as it also did in the time of troubles. In this case, it's because the uh, the weave is destroyed. Mistra dies. A lot of the gods exit the scene. Mastika disappears, and a new continent from a bear appears off out in its place. A city of dragonborn from a bear appears in uh, northeastern uh, Farron. You know, it's uh, a. Then the the underdark gets opened up, and it's no longer underground. It's like a chasm now. 
Is that well, part, well, there's a big a big hole opens up into it. I mean, the um, okay. the the Underdark which basically underlies all of the Forgotten Realms. Well, they didn't change much, did they? Jeez, <laughs> you have to scrape off the whole top layer to open it all up. But they did open a big hole down into it. And then after we did all that, then we then we jumped the calendar forward a hundred years and said, okay, and now we're talking about this this version of the Forgotten Realms. Well, I think like you know, like I said, I think the. Uh, some of these things were really cool, like the Time of Troubles I thought had a lot of really neat story elements to it. But I wonder, Richard, do you feel like that these multiple apocalypses <laughs> that have occurred in the Forgotten Realms, do you think that that may have altered the basic premise of what the Forgotten Realms is about? Do you feel like it's it may It's kind have... of a thing when you have to figure out what the plural of apocalypse is. <laughs> well, I think that... Apocalypses, uh, I believe. Well, I think that the heart of the realms remains in that it's this grand and glorious world of high fantasy and high adventure and 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 powerful monsters and powerful magic where you know there's room to have all kinds of interesting adventures i mean i think that's that's the great constant as far as do things get lost when you have these big cataclysms well, you know there's always going to be a risk that whatever some individual particularly loved is going to get squashed you know if you're writing about cataclysm some stuff is going to get squashed that said, you know, we've got the, um, you know, we did the spell play. We did the 100-year time jump. Now we're doing the sundering, which is basically kind of uh, on one level is uh, a way of bringing back some things that people have communicated that they really missed about the realms. That, you know, that stuff's coming back. And uh, the guys at Wizards basically say that the sundering is the last big cataclysmic kind of thing like that we're going to have for quite a while now. What they'll say next year, I don't know. But (laughs) Richard, I'm just curious. uh, Do you know who came up with the name of the Sundering? I don't know that specifically. No. Well, I'm I'm just curious because, from an outside observer, looking at what's happened with Dungeons and Dragons over the last several years, um, specifically the splintering of its fan base between uh, Pathfinder and uh, various other third party stuff, and what is going to be now Dungeons and Dragons next. I found the name "The Sundering" to be somewhat questionable, <laughs> given given the context of the time period. Yeah, well, I think uh, I see what you're saying. It's it's, um, but it actually refers to the nature of the event. I mean, I'm the, sure it does. I'm sure in, it's in, just, the, in the story. I'm sure that's. I don't, true. I don't know if Richard can comment on this or not, but something I read online that actually made the name make sense to me is: remember, the two worlds were colliding and merging. Now they're being ripped back apart. They're being sundered apart. Yeah, like I'm, I'm, sh- I'm absolutely certain that in context of the universe that it's being written for, it makes perfect sense. But from the out, you know, when you're looking at the posters on the walls at Gen Con, saying "Come to the Sundering event," <laughs> you know, and it's not really giving you any of that context of what's happening in the world. You're just seeing it. And you're like, okay, so Watsi's big thing this year is about the Sundering. Well, uh, I literally got the context today when I was reading up for the show. Okay, so so you you may see what I mean there. That's all. I'm yes. Getting at. But, well, they had to call it something. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just I think it was a slightly unfortunate uh, terminology uh, f- uh, failure there. So yeah, so these these uh, these multiple changes have occurred. The the landscape has has greatly shifted. Um, the Forgotten Realms, because this has a pretty I would say in depth continuity that you can trace from you know Ed's original work all the way up to. I, yeah, honestly, I, I haven't been that much up on it since uh, since third edition, um, but I know that there, you know, there are still still characters and still places and things that are carrying on. Right. So, how does uh, Richard? You, have you have you run uh, as a GM? Have you run games set in the Forgotten Realms? You know, I never have. Okay. Have you ever <laughs> played in a game set in the Forgotten Realms? Never have. Okay. <laughs> well, Daryl has. Uh, yes. So, Daryl, why don't you give us your perspective on? what it's like to be a GM of, of the Forgotten Realm. I've been both a player and a... It's one of the few settings I can say. I've been a player and a GM about equally in Forgotten Realms, and there are a lot of advantages and disadvantages to actually playing in there. Uh, the biggest one is... Biggest advantage we've talked about already is... And it's this is how I put it in the show notes. There are lots of toys to play with. There are so many books and so many guides and so many so much resource out there that... I never have to prep anything when I'm running a game because it's like, okay, I need a tavern. Thumb, 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 thumb. Okay, that's the right location. That one sounds good. I don't have to do any prep whatsoever. It's already there. So I can just pull up anything I want and voila. It's a godsend for a GM to do that. The flip side to that is 
every time I run a Forgotten Realms game, I always have the, well, actually, guy in my game. What does that mean? Well, actually, at this point in time, uh, Baron was not in the Mithril Hall. He was in the Underdark fighting the fight. Yeah. The Bruner? guy that's read every single book, every single novel. I, I believe you're referring to Bruner Battlehammer. Well, Thank actually, you. Bruner Battlehammer. I was trying to, I was trying, I'm, I'm horrible with names. See, I'm sorry. I'm illustrating your point is what exactly. I'm Exactly. <laughs> These, but it's anytime you try to do anything, they will, Come, they will come up with, well, in this book, it says this, and you either have to say, you either have to give them an inch and say, okay, you're right, or you have to say, not in my game. You Which, know, I'm just going to put this if you out do there. That too many times. It's, for, for maximum impact, you need to use your best comic book guy voice from The Simpsons when you say those things. Actually, I, don't have, you I, I was trying to. <laughs> I was trying to. That's about as good as I get, uh, unfortunately. Right. But, uh, one, I, I have come up recently with a solution I haven't gotten to implement yet, which is one I got from, uh, Spoonie, uh, Noah Antweiler on his, uh, uh, Counter Monkey show, which is, yeah, that is weird, isn't it? No, it's, that's a great answer for that. Absolutely. Or you just leave it to them to figure out, oh, what was a mistake now becomes a mystery. No, it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful answer to that. I totally agree. I'm, I'd take the direct, I would take the easy approach to say, not in my game. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, hell, all, every, no two versions of the Forgotten Realms are going to be the same. I mean, just by just by the fact that, you know, the particular group of player characters that exist in your campaign and no other campaign are running around doing stuff immediately forks it off into being a different timeline anyway. And that's something that actually came up when I was playing in a game. One of my first ongoing campaigns, it's one of my favorite games, and I wish it would have lasted longer, was it was in Waterdeep. Where we were playing, we were trying to start up a thieves guild in Waterdeep, and whenever that I tried like a to, really fun game, by the way, it, it was an awesome game. And I tried to redo that a while back, and I was doing research on it, and I read up and says there are no thieves guilds in Waterdeep because all the other guilds crush them the second they show up. I'm like, hmm, okay. So he just said, screw it, I'm doing my thing, and it was a great game, I'm sure. Yes, it with was all awesome. the flavor of the Forgotten Realms, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's the important bit, right? Yeah, we were in water. He had the, he had like three different box sets. So we had those big, huge, giant poster maps of Waterdeep right. that he would have laying out on the table. So it was brilliant. Now I have to ask this question because you know Richard is a an author in the Forgotten Realms and and not a single book author either. He's written many books in the Forgotten Realms, so it's fair to say he knows it really well. So Richard, my question to you would be: If you were to GM a game in the Forgotten Realms. Do you have an idea of what your game would be about? Probably. You mean like an overarching plot? Well, it doesn't have to be that. I mean, it can uh, be just like how we start out or, you know, I'm, I'm just wondering. I'm sure the, I'm sure the idea has crossed your mind. Well, I really like the moon sea. I wrote um, part of my, uh, actually a good deal of my uh, Year Rogue Dragons trilogy is set around the moon sea. And I think that's a really nice kind of um, contained area. It's, it's, you know, for part of the Forgotten Realms where you aren't necessarily going to have, like, the the huge powers uh, coming in there and messing around there all the time. It's far enough from Cormir and Netheril and places like that that, that they, that, you know, the big Mordor kind of places or whatever are, aren't going to be screwing around with it too much normally. We've got all these nice little, uh, you know, kind of nice little city-state sort of areas. You've got the Zentarum at the west end of it, who are a good ongoing group. I know I would probably probably set the game at least while the characters were working up a few levels, starting out around the Moon Sea. Other than that, I'm, other than that, I'm really not sure. It sounds cool. I'd play in that. What about you, Daryl? If you were going to run a game in the Forgotten Realms, what would your game be about? I actually got about, when I was reading, like I said, before we recorded the show today, I was reading up about all the other things I'm like, oh yeah, that would be awesome. Oh yeah, that would be awesome. Oh yeah, that would be awesome. I really want to do a really deep, like getting into the political intrigue of Waterdeep, a really good urban campaign where you never really leave the city. It's oh, all about yeah. dealing with that. Or without even leaving the geographical area, let's go into Undermountain. <laughs> the <laughs> biggest dungeon ever created by the Mad Mage. So let's start exploring and f- seeing what weird stuff's down there. Well, the Undermountain is a enormous dungeon and it's one of my favorite supplements for um forgotten realms in fact i would say that you can get an awful lot of ed's flavor 
just from actually reading his descriptions of the dungeon rooms mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, from Undermountain. And, it, and it's got a wonderful character who created it, uh, this guy called Halister Blackcloak. Mm-hmm. Uh, again, one of these, one, one of the many Archmages who calls uh, Favor in his home. <laughs> It was made famous uh, to new people like me who don't know. Like I said, I only know the Dritz novels and Waterdeep pretty much, but I didn't know Hallister until the last Penny Arcade thing where they had a big giant Pacific Rim tribute where they had a giant animated statue of Hallister fighting a Tarask in the middle of the city. <laughs> was this part of their, was this a comic that they did? Or? No, this was their uh, demo game they did at oh. the 2013 PAX ah, uh, run by Chris Perkins. Cool. All right. Well, there and you Patrick go. Patrick Rothfuss uh, replaced Will Wheaton in this one. So, ah. Yeah, Patrick Rothfuss, he's also an author we may have written, read some books of as well. So, all right. Um, that's, that's very cool for me. I would say, uh, my love of Forgotten Realms actually stems from, as I said, from the Gray Box and, uh, from the, the Baldur's Gate books. So the Sword Coast would be one of the places I think I would want to explore a little more. But also, you know, I'm, I think the mark of a great campaign setting is that it makes you want to run games everywhere or it makes you want to run games in a lot of different places. See, I can't think of a campaign. But there's a game. I would love to run just a session. I can't remember the name of the city, but it's the city that's kind of isolated by itself because it's the one where they do all the magical experiments oh, and okay. they have the shield up around themselves. It was in the, it was in the second, I think, of Salvatore's books was the first place I remember seeing it, but I think it was chronicled before then. Okay. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? I don't, I, I don't remember the name of it. But you know the place I'm talking about. I, it's Yeah, it rings a bell. I've read that novel, but I've read it for a number of years, so it's a, a little hate. But it was, but it was just, it's basically just, they're not gnomes, but it's, imagine a gnome tinkerer, but they're all mages, and they're going nuts in this little city because they know they can do whatever they want. Speaking of mages going nuts, there is the mage asylum called Spellhold, which is on the Sword Coast near, near Am. I do not know this, but I'm intrigued. It's it's from Baldur's Gate 2. It's one of the core places you go and venture, um, and it's really cool. And like I said, I think that's one of the strengths, one of the things you can point to the Forgotten Realms to say, this is why the Forgotten Realms is great, is that you can look at different pieces of it, and they can be novels, they can be computer games, they can be even comic books, or even the source material you know, directly out of the, the core uh, gray box, and you will find something that makes you say, I want to run a game here. I challenge you to not find something that you you don't you don't want to run a game in. <laughs> yeah, I, I would agree. It's like if you don't you know if you don't find something in the realms that gets you interested and excited. I mean, you, you probably aren't a sword and sorcery fan in the first place. <laughs> there's so much. I, I think a lot of that goes back to, and I'm looking at my fact sheet again. Uh, Ed Greenwood's rule for writing in the realms: quote, for every one of my loose ends you tie up or explain. Create three new ones and weave them into the realms to keep it alive and interesting. Huh. <laughs> that's a that's an interesting approach. I'm not sure I agree with that 100, percent but it's uh it does explain an awful lot. <laughs> and it's definitely a way to keep a setting that's this in depth alive in ways because there's so much you can do in it. And when you, as a, in published material, start addressing some of it, you have to have new material to replace it. So well, that's there's. A- there's been an awful lot of settings, I would say, over the past that have suffered from excess of content. You know, where where just the 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 flavor, the uniqueness of it is kind of bled away over time. And I would even point to such things as like Dragonlance, which over the years has become kind of a big mess of stuff. You know, you go back to the '80s and Speaking you know exactly of a cataclysm every other week. Yeah, well, you, you, like I said, you go back to the '80s, and you know exactly what Dragonlance is about. But if you ask me today what it's about, I couldn't tell you. But the, the Forgotten Realms has been very fortunate in that it does retain that unique flavor. It does. And I think a lot of that has to do with Ed sort of still being involved after all these years. I think one big advantage that the Realms has over um, Kryn, the Dragonlance world, of setting you know, to remain fresh and exciting is that Kryn is, you know, you talk about the Elminster Syndrome. Kryn, all the stories about that really, really are about the companions of the lands, that core group of characters. And yeah. it's very clear that very clear that things that don't happen to them are peripheral. And I would argue that despite the existence of characters like Elminster and Drizzt, that the uh, the realms is much more wide open. I mean, it, it's it's not about some single character or group of characters whose influence uh, determines everything. It's 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 the world, you know. Well, I, I agree with you in the larger sense that, that what you said is, you know, large, that, that the realm's characters don't define everything about the realm. That's totally true. We should have a conversation about Dragonlance sometimes. I think we'd have some interesting points on on different things there for sure. 
let's actually go back to some of the things, uh, you know, Forgotten Realms that are great. Do you guys remember the Bloodstone trilogy of adventures? Yeah. Those are amazing. So long ago, I can remember almost nothing. These were like, you know, one of the things about the Forgotten Realms that is cool um, is that it does allow you to play games at many different levels in the Forgotten Realms. Like you can play a first level zero to hero story. You can be like, we're all from a little village tucked away in a dale somewhere. Or you can play, you know, hey, we are basically the Justice League where we are high level characters of the Harpers or something. And the the Bloodstone trilogy was for these high level epic characters. And it was, uh, you fought Orcus, if I remember right. <laughs> you yeah. straight up fought Orcus. <laughs> it's, it's a bad ass series of adventures, dude. And there's places like that in the Forgotten Realms. You can like page through and you can find there's, uh, there used to be a, I forget the name of it, but there was a castle that, uh, a keep where a hole had been opened up to the lower planes and demons were just pouring out of it all the time. Stuff like that. They had, they had many level, many different, regions of the of their their setting where you could say like let's say we're walking around as first level characters right there's kind of an expectation that anything we are going to encounter is going to be appropriate for our level but in the forgotten realms it's totally possible to have a dragon fly overhead even when you're a first level character because that's what the setting is like i mean you, there is non-level appropriate material you know turn the wrong corner and you walk straight into a beholder at first right. level Right, and and I think that adds actually a, a a cool bit to to gaming and playing in the Forgotten Realms is that you know because these things are there out there, uh, you play a little bit differently. You know, it it feels a little bit more unique because of that. I'm sitting here remembering the Bloodstone modules. I wrote uh, in Year of Rogue Dragons part of my uh, part of my story is set in the Bloodstone land. So I oh, had great. To, uh, I had to uh, basically. Uh, see what all was in those modules and, and make sure I was consistent with it. And, and of course, uh, you know, steal ideas and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, the forgotten realms has been blessed to have not only a lot of great authors and a lot of great supplements, they've had a lot of great adventures too. under mountain being one that we've already discussed a little bit, which actually became a box set on its own. I believe uh, two box started- sets, two box sets actually. Cause there was a series. And then so, even oh. more stuff on top of that, there was, yeah. Two box, there was an adventure, two box sets, and then, like, it, it was almost like, it was more like a campaign setting book. Right, but there's also Under Illifarn, and Under Illifarn is a great second edition dungeon, basically. I wouldn't call it an adventure, but it's definitely a dungeon, and it's a really cool one. There's the Haunted Halls of Evening Star, which is uh, a, well, probably one of my favorite low-level Forgotten Realms adventures, because it introduce, introduces you to an awful lot of really cool things in the realms, including the Zentarim are part of that. Are you guys familiar with that particular adventure? I am not. Okay. Well, I encourage you to check it out sometimes. It is very, very cool. And, uh, of course, there's been some uh, adventures later on. Daryl, can you think of any adventures that you remember uh, being memorable? There is one, and I just cannot think of it or anything to describe it right now. Okay. F- sa- safe but. to say that you also have fond memories of, of adventures. Oh, yeah. In the Forgotten Realms. Okay. Because a lot of the uh, encounters seasons that's been going on are actually in Forgotten Realms for d Next. Right. So that brings us to like, you know, things have changed and now we're in the fourth edition and fifth edition Forgotten Realms. And as I said earlier in this podcast, I am not honestly that familiar with what, what is kind of the new status quo. And Richard and Daryl have kind of talked to us a little bit about that, but this would be a great question since we have Richard on. Uh, what is like, if you had to explain to someone what the Forgotten Realms are about now based on the changes and things that have occurred and, and what's, what the newest, uh, storylines and stuff are. How would you describe the Forgotten Realms? What is it about? Then, like I said, I would always describe it, you know, at any point in this history as a, as a world of, you know, high adventure, high fantasy, you know, big magic, big monsters. The, the current event is the Sundering where, you know, we are, in fact, you know, having another kind of big cosmic sea change, which is taking the uh, taking us forward into the next setting. And uh, A.O. is rewriting the uh, tablet, isn't he? Yeah, that's part of it. That's that's kind of the ultimate metaphysical justification for what's going on that and the fact that as you said the two worlds are now coming apart again so what kind of impact did that have if i want to set a game in in this uh in this particular part of history you know it depends on where you want to set it because it's having different impacts in different places what's the thing that's happening everywhere though is that you know the gods are who are under our kind of freaked out that he's rewriting the tablets because they don't know what it's going to say, you know, what they're going to say, <laughs> what their, exactly what their situation will be when they are revised. So they're all in, they're all kind of scrambling to increase their. They're on panic mode. Yeah, they're, they're to increase their power as much as they can, reasoning that, well, you know, that's, that's, 
you know, that's the, the best thing that we can do to improve our odds because, um, you know, you can't go up against Al. <laughs> uh, so, they, you know, whatever, whatever he dishes out, they kind of have to take it. But they say, well, if I'm a powerful God, when it all comes down, I'm probably better off than if I'm a not so powerful God. Well, in the Forgotten Realms, the power of a God is related to how many worshipers he has. So uh, all these gods are raising up uh, chosen human agents that are imbued with some of their divine power who are supposed to uh, increase the power of their face and increase their presence on Earth and um, in the realms, not on Earth, uh, and uh, in the mortal sphere and make them more powerful deities. And then you have uh, people who are aware that... uh, these chosen have, are coming into existence and looking to exploit them for their own ends. So that's something that's that's something that you can deal with no matter where in the realms you're adventuring. Then, like say, depending on which area, specific area you're in, the sundering is having different effects in different places. In the Sea of Fallen Stars area, which is what my sundering novel is about, they're having a perpetual rainfall. Just. Uh, hmm. And with all the uh, inv- all the problems that brings in terms of uh, flooding, crop failure, famine, good stuff like that. Yeah, but is it is it fresh water that falls from the in the rain? Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, that that would have a positive impact on at least uh, sailing. <laughs> well, well, the, except for the rough the seas. Fact, the fact that the the sea is rising and rising and rising is and then devouring all these uh, you know coastal villages and stuff is not seen as positive. Well, true, but I mean at least you won't at least you won't die of thirst. That's true. You won't die of thirst. <laughs> okay, cool. Well, that's that's pretty interesting stuff. You know, something occurred to me when I was just thinking about the stuff that you said you really were into like Thay. We brought up earlier, you know, these uh video games that are really I I I think are are great intros to uh, to the Forgotten Realms. And I, I thought I'd make a, no, a, a note of telling you, Richard, um, that they do go into uh, some pretty interesting places in those video games with regards to Thay. In the enhanced edition of Baldur's Gate 2, they have what's called the Black Pits, which is kind of these gladiatorial arenas. And it's this, this whole storyline of a red wizard who has sort of des- designed this, uh, this testing ground for uh, warriors to, you know, see who the, who the greatest of them all is. And he has a, has a very interesting menagerie of servants, including a fallen deva, which is kind of cool. Yeah, that that sounds like something a red wizard would do. (laughs) (laughs) Awesome. This is probably the point where we should turn it over to Richard and let him tell us about what is coming out from him that we should be on the lookout for, because uh, I know he's got several books in the pipeline and at least one that has just recently come out. Okay, well, the book that has just come out is, in fact, my Sundering novel. It's called The Reaver. It came out on February the 4th, and uh, I uh, encourage everybody to uh, check it out. The uh, nature of the uh, Sundering series is that um, each of the books can be read separately, uh, although if you read them all, you will get the big, grand, and glorious picture of what the Sundering is doing to uh, all of Farron, but each one, but each one has uh, its own storyline. And uh, so if you haven't gotten around to reading one of the books before mine, you can still read mine and enjoy it. Mine is about all new characters. So if you haven't read any of my previous books, it doesn't matter. Once again, you can enjoy it. I have got you know a bunch of books out over the years. You can find them all by looking me up on Amazon. I've got uh, a couple uh, uh, self-published ebooks I'm really uh, proud of and I'd like to pimp. One is a collection of my uh, sword and sorcery stories that are not set in shared worlds. Uh, it's called The Plague mm-hmm. Knight and Other Stories. You can get that on Amazon. I've got a, uh, a collection that's a little bit of this, a little bit of that, some of my fantasy, some of my horror, one humorous essay called uh, The Q Word and Other Stories, again, on, on Amazon. I have a uh, post-apocalyptic superhero series called The Imposter you can get. Well, hang on. I, I think I really want to hear you tell us about The Imposter because I've read the I've read the sort of synopsis of it and it sounds fascinating. I would love to read more about this, but please tell our listeners, what is The Imposter about? Okay, it's set in what was kind of your standard uh, uh, superhero world. Uh, if you, you know, are, are familiar with the Marvel Universe or the DC Universe, uh, this place would... Uh, kind of uh, seem familiar to you, but uh, that was before. That was before the story starts. Um, if you read, again, if you read superhero comics, you know that they periodically have to fight off an alien invasion. Well, the premise of uh, of, of my story is that uh, 
some aliens came and won and basically are have, have conquered the earth and are uh, in, in the, now kind of getting ready to uh, make it into what they want it to be. And we have human beings, you know, surviving in the rubble and, uh, you know, being hunted, gradually hunted down. And in this world, basically all the superheroes went down fighting like the uh, noble champions that they are. But the supervillains, only caring about themselves, went to ground. So they're still around. So in in this, and they're you know trying to make the best of things that they can. Basically, trying to uh, enslave surviving normal human beings and set up uh, you know little uh, kingdoms for themselves while trying to fend off the aliens. Anyway, that's all the background. The hero is uh, kind of a normal everyman sort of guy who by chance falls heir to the devices that gave a couple of the superheroes their uh, powers before they uh, got killed. And uh, he, through a chain of circumstances, he finds himself uh, impersonating those heroes and uh, (laughs) trying to do, uh, you know, trying to fight the aliens, eventually trying to uh, make common cause with the villains, because that's that's the only way that he's ever going to get a force strong enough to maybe be able to oppose the uh, aliens. But of course, all the uh, villains are treacherous bastards who all hate the person that they believe him to be. So uh, that doesn't always go well. And uh, anyway, it's I've got uh, two volumes of this out so far with uh, more to come. That sounds fantastic. I, I, would... say, I think I think you hit pretty much every single one of Ross's little <laughs> notes on that one. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we will have to uh, see if we can uh, get a, a review copy of that or maybe some, one to give away uh, on our show. Yeah, they're on – I said so ebook only. They're, um, uh, you, they're on uh, – number two is only on uh, – Amazon at this point in time because I decided to experiment with the, uh, you know, the, the Kindle only thing, which gives you extra opportunities for self promotion and stuff. Right. So Amazon is the place to, to, to get my ebooks. Okay. I will have uh, links in the show notes. Yeah. And I, if we're going to plug stuff, we should also mention uh, the festival <laughs> of Glen, El- uh, Glen Elg again, right? Uh, well, why not? <laughs> <laughs> my, my novella set in the, uh, a cursed universe, which I had a ball riding, and I'm very proud of, and I hope everybody will go read it. Yeah, I want to say Richard did a great job taking the dark fantasy setting of a cursed and, and turning it into a, a short novel. Which um, this this is not about a cursed, so I won't go on at length about <laughs> it. But I did really enjoy uh, the book, and it is it is available online to uh, to purchase for a very reasonable price. So check that out. Um, let's uh, let's close this out. I think with uh, one last question about the Forgotten Realms. Favorite gaming product. What is your favorite gaming product of the Forgotten Realms, Richard? I really like that Menzo Berenzon box set. Oh, it is good. Yeah, why, what do you love about it? Well, I love about it that I was able to write a decent drown novel by cribbing from <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 uh, beyond Useful that, it's, source material. It's, it's, it's full of interesting detail. Menzo Berenzon, it's just it's such an interesting, exotic place. You know, with, like I said, it's all... So strange and beautiful and evil. It's it's it's, it's my kind of fantasy environment. Daryl, it's such a good favorite? book. It's such a good book. Apparently, that even the professionals reference it. What's so. what's your favorite, Daryl? Mine is one. I can never remember which one it is. I can never remember which well, one it is. But look that it's up. the it's <laughs> no, it's the. I can tell you what is in it, but I can't remember which of the Waterdeep books it is because well, Waterdeep, duh. But it's because I can never. I keep buying them off Amazon or eBay. Or at a con when I see them in a bin, but I always grab the wrong one. So I think I've got all the Waterdeep books except the one I'm looking for, which is the one with the big, huge, giant poster maps and the big gazetteer that basically details like a quarter of all the buildings in the city. I think you're referencing the second edition Waterdeep box set. Yeah, I cannot find it. All right, well, let's let's, let's then say that Daryl Mott's favorite is the Waterdeep box set, which... And if anyone has one, please email me, abstruse at gamerstavern.org. I will make you a good offer. It is a very good product, I have to. With the poster map, though. With the map. And I do love it. What what do you love about the the Waterdeep box set? Like I said, it's this is the city that I, when I think of Forgotten Realms, the first thing that pops in my head is Waterdeep. Because it is such an interesting place. Because you can run, even without going into the rest of Faerun, you can run pretty much anything you want in the city. You can run your urban adventure campaign. You can run your political intrigue campaign. You can... Use Waterdeep as the town that you resupply in for your for your expeditions into Undermountain as a standard 
dungeon crawly campaign. You can even use it as the basis for a best selling board game. Yes, which, which again is that political intrigue, the Lords of Waterdeep board game. Which we which is also also a lot of fun to play on the iPad. Oh, it's available yeah, that, on the iPad? Yeah, yeah, yeah that that iPad. came out about two a month and a half ago, I think. Oh my god, I'm gonna have to get this on my my iOS. I was not aware you could play it on the. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I did when we did our Gamers Tavern Award. I did award best expansion to uh, uh, Skullport. That's right. Because... Now Skullport segue is part <laughs> of Under Mountain, mm-hmm. and Under Mountain would be my selection for my favorite Forgotten Realms product. It was, it was this was a tough decision. There were a lot of really good ones, um, but Under Mountain was the one that. It's probably the first one that just made me say, wow, this is so amazing. It, it was the first mega dungeon I think I'd ever seen. And the story of all the stuff that was underneath there, it, it just it, it felt like I could just run games in Under Mountain for the rest of my life. <laughs> and you probably could. I probably could. Uh, that's going to bring us to Last Call. Uh, Richard, where can people find you on the interwebs if they want to know more about you? Follow me or friend me on Facebook, which is probably where I mouth off the most often. Online. <laughs> uh, I'm, they can, uh, I'm on Twitter. I'm even on uh, Google Plus for some reason. Uh, <laughs> I have a, I have a, a, a blog of, uh, on Live Journal where they can find, find me. Although a lot of that is just uh, a lot of that is just links to other stuff. Uh, I write a monthly opinion column for a science fiction news site called. Uh, Airlock Alpha. So if you want to read a little oh. uh, essay for me, for me for free every month, you can, that's where you can find that. If, if I had your blog, I would have to title it "Blowing Up Thay." <laughs> <laughs> uh, but that's that's awesome. Okay, and uh, final thoughts from you or Daryl on on Forgotten Realms, and then we'll be ushered out of here by the Imperial Guard. My final thought is: it is a richly detailed setting that. You can easily become obsessed with. You can spend many, many hours exploring it and still find something brand new to find. I would uh, endorse all that. I would also say that uh, for people who uh, feel that maybe we've lost a little bit of the flavor of the setting or that something that you particularly liked uh, got lost in the shuffle of the spell plague and the uh, time jump, please come take a look at what we're doing in the Sundering because I think you may find that uh, what you've been missing is coming back. Awesome. Thank you so much for being on the show with us today, Richard. We really appreciate having you. Oh, it was uh, great. Thank you for having me. Again, I'm, I'm one of your biggest fans, and uh, I hope you appreciate that. I am so looking forward to reading more of your stuff. It, I think I'm going to have to go check out The Imposter now. So. <laughs> I hope you enjoy it. <laughs> All right. So once again, I uh, want to thank you for being on the Gamers Tavern. And if, if, to our listeners, if any of you have any comments or uh, questions about the Forgotten Realms, please make sure and post them on our blog at gamerstavern.org or on our Facebook. And at Facebook.com slash right? Gamers Tavern. Or leave a review for us on iTunes. All right, and that'll cut it for episode 20 of the Gamers Tavern. May all your hits be crits. Have you been looking for a dark fantasy RPG setting? Are you interested in seeing a new take on the action horror genre? Then you should check out Accursed. Accursed is a setting for the Savage Worlds RPG created by me, Ross Watson, and my good friends Jason Marker and John Dunn. It is a world where the heroes are monsters who fight for redemption against the witches who have conquered their land. To find out more about Accursed, search for Accursed on drivethroughrpg.com. Accursed is now on sale there and in many other fine retailers for gaming PDFs. Thank you very much, and I hope you enjoy Accursed. Gamers Tavern's listenership has exploded in 2014, and we want to reward you, our loyal listeners, by holding a contest. We've got a winner-take-all bundle of amazing games, and to top it all off, an iPod Shuffle preloaded with the latest episodes of the Gamers Tavern. So, what other games do you get? How about a signed copy of Accursed, the dark fantasy Savage Worlds campaign setting where you play the monsters fighting against the witches who cursed you, provided by Melior Via. A signed copy of Tefra, the steampunk fantasy role-playing game of high adventure set in an alternate world, provided by Cracked Monocle. A signed copy of Dementalism, a card game from the twisted and strange world of low life, provided by Mother Oith Creations. And a signed copy of Better Angels, a game of demonic comic book supervillainry, provided by Arc Dream Publications. 
And you also get one free admission to Con on the Cob, a celebration of game, art, freaks, and fun in Hudson, Ohio from October 16th through the 19th with the purchase of one adult admission. In order to secure your chance to win this amazing prize package, send an email to contest at gamerstavern.org with the subject line, Mac Sent. Include your name, mailing address, and one suggestion for how you would make the Gamers Tavern podcast even better. Once again, that email address is contest at gamerstavern.org with the subject line, Mac Sent. Sorry, but this contest is for U.S. residents only. Full contest rules are available at gamerstavern.org slash contest. Get your entry in by midnight central time on March 10th, 2014 for your chance to win it all.